Faces come in so many different shapes and sizes, and these variations between person to person are significant, and not just between men and women. There are variations in forehead size and shape, and there are race or ancestry variations in eye shape and brow bones. I wanna discuss some things with you that's not ever really spoken about when it comes to getting Botox or any other neuromodulator. Dysport, Xeomin, Daxify, and that's how important it is to have your Botox customized to you. This not only affects your results, it also affects your pockets because if you're getting cookie cutter, one size fits all standardized dosing that's not tailored to you and your features and muscle strain, you could be paying a lot more for Botox than necessary, or you could end up being an happy with your outcome. A common example is when a woman says her brows feel heavier after Botox and she notices a difference when applying makeup. She now has to raise her eyebrows up in order to apply eyeshadow or a man comes in after his Botox with what he feels is new lines to his hairline area. I have a love and appreciation for studying anthropology and the diversity of faces. And I apply this knowledge when I treat patients to maximize the best outcomes. So I'm gonna share what I've learned from treating patients over the last 10 plus years with Botox and we're going to talk about gender and racial or ancestral variations because they play a big role in customizing your treatment so that you can get the best possible outcome. So stay tuned. Starting with our forehead. Our foreheads are the most difficult area to treat with Botox because there are so many variations between people's foreheads. And there are certain people who have to be very careful when treating this area with Botox. If you have a short forehead, hooded eye shape, monolid eye shape, or a low brow position, you have to be very careful when doing Botox to your forehead. There's short foreheads, medium foreheads, high foreheads, and then you have narrow foreheads and wide foreheads. And your dosage of Botox is very dependent on the physical size of your forehead in both height and width and your muscle strength. The frontalis muscle, which is here, is the muscle that we inject to get rid of horizontal wrinkles. And there are so many different patterns of wrinkles from person to person, and this muscle is unique because it's the only muscle that can raise our eyebrows and we're all wired so differently. For example, some people can raise one eyebrow at a time. Comment below if you can or know someone who can. I know I can't, I'm not wired that way. As we evolved from archaic humans, our foreheads grew longer and our brow bone became much less prominent, giving us more ability to have facial expression, which was useful for nonverbal communication. When we inject this area to minimize horizontal forehead lines, we're also weakening or paralyzing the muscle. And losing some of our ability to raise our brows, as you can see, from the picture on the right. And again, this muscle is the only muscle that allows us to raise our brows. This is why it's the most difficult area to treat with Botox. Too much Botox or Botox in the wrong area can cause someone's brows to lower and feel heavy to the point where they can't raise their brows at all. So treatment of this muscle not only reduces horizontal forehead lines, it can also affect our eyebrow shape and height. So when it comes to forehead size and treating this muscle, the shorter your forehead, the more careful you have to be with doing Botox to this area. And sometimes people with very short foreheads cannot tolerate all but maybe a few units of Botox here because the shorter your forehead, the shorter frontalis muscle, and they may need all of their already short muscle to raise their brows. And those with short foreheads can feel very heavy after Botox if you use too many units here. But since the muscle is not as large on people with short foreheads, they usually don't have as many rows of horizontal wrinkles compared to those who have larger, higher foreheads. So the bottom line is they don't need as much Botox here. If I could average the amount of units I treat a woman's forehead with, it would be around 10 units, give or take a few units. Sometimes maybe it's 12. And on someone with a shorter forehead, maybe it's eight. And on a very short forehead, I may only do three to five units. So the smaller the dose, the less money if the provider charges by unit. Another reason not to use too much Botox to those who have shorter foreheads is the shorter your forehead, the heavier and more prominent your brow tends to look. Just look at the difference between Teresa. Her real profile is on the left and they photoshopped her with a higher forehead on the right. 
the height of the forehead makes a big difference in the prominence of the brows. As the height from the forehead is reduced, the eyes will focus more on the brow bone in the same way that if you have a small chin, the eyes will focus more on the mid face, making the nose look larger. And we've spoken about this in the chin filler videos. So if someone has a short forehead, you don't want to make their brows look even heavier by reducing too much of their ability to raise them. When it comes to men and women, forehead height and width are generally greater in men and men usually have stronger muscles. So on average, they usually need more Botox than women. The sides or lateral area of the forehead muscle often goes up much higher into the hairline with men. And since providers are used to treating female faces, what can happen with men is they'll return after the results are in full effect from Botox with areas that still have movement to their upper forehead near their hairline. And I've been guilty of this a few times. So they'll have to get additional units so everything can look more uniform. Regarding ethnicity differences, there doesn't seem seem to be much difference in forehead height between races, with the exception of Iranian and Croatian males. One study showed their forehead height to be significantly smaller than other ethnic groups. I've observed that East Africans tend to have a higher forehead size, so they'll likely need more Botox to this area. Eye shape plays a role in getting Botox as the eyes come in many different shapes. You have round, almond, downturned, hooded, and monolid. You have to be careful about treating your frontalis or forehead area if you have hooded eyes or a monolid eye shape. The reason is because in these two eye shapes, the eyes appear smaller and heavier looking because these eye shapes don't have as a defined of an upper eyelid crease. The difference between hooded eyes and monolid eyes are that people with hooded eyes have excess skin to their upper eyelid. Taylor Swift is an example of someone with a hooded eye shape, whereas people with monolid eye shape have excess fat around their eyes along with an epicanthic fold. The epicanthic fold is a skin fold of the upper eyelid that covers the inner core corner of the eye, and it's often associated with greater levels of fat deposition around the eyes, which can make the eyelids appear puffy. So who is more likely to have hooded eyes? People of European ancestry tend to have this eye shape more often as they're more common in skin phototypes one and two. Men and people who are overweight can also be more likely to have this eye shape. Sometimes if someone has very pronounced hooding to their eyes where it's interfering with vision, that puts them at a bigger risk or tendency to develop more horizontal lines to their forehead because they're using this muscle to constantly raise their brows to compensate to help them see better. Let's use Taylor Swift as an example. Let's say someone like Taylor came in for her Botox. You have to play the game and take it slow because she has hooded eyes. So you'll treat conservatively based on her forehead size, the amount of lines she has and her muscle strength. And then you see her at a two week follow up, look at her before and afters and ask if she feels heavy. You can always add, but the important thing is you don't want to make anyone feel heavy. You can see Taylor from 18 to now has a much more open eye and much more of a defined eyelid crease than she did before. She's likely had upper blepharoplasty, which is an eyelid surgery to reduce hooding or the amount of skin over the upper eyelid. And she also has a higher brow position, so she probably also had a brow lift as well. This is a surgical procedure. Botox would not do this. It's likely from surgery. When it comes to monolid eye shape or epicanthic folds, they're very common in people of East Asian, Central Asian, Northern and Southeast Asian and Pacific Island ancestries. But other ancestries can also have this eye shape, like some Norwegians, Finnish, Swedish, and Russians, and some African populations such as the Khoisan. This eye shape is called monolid because in people with epicanthic folds, the eyes can appear to have only one lid. One meaning mono versus two, or what's known as a double eyelid. But if you have an epicanthic fold, you can have a double eyelid crease, as is the case with Janine. She has more of a faint epicanthic fold and more of a defined supratarsal or upper eyelid crease, whereas Lucy has more of a distinct epicanthic fold and no crease. And if you don't have an eyelid crease, your eyelids tend to appear heavier and puffier because having an eyelid crease helps separate your eyelids into two sections. The more defined eyelid crease, the more open appearing your eyes. So how does having an epicanthic fold or monolid eye shape play into getting Botox? Now, I don't necessarily agree with this, but I attended a cosmetic medical conference in which a plastic surgeon who specialized in doing surgery on the eyes 
an oculoplastic surgeon who is East Asian, gave a lecture on treating patients with East Asian ancestry with Botox. And she says she doesn't treat any of her East Asian patients with Botox to their frontalis muscle or forehead muscle because the eyelids of East Asians are already heavy. So she feels they need all the lift they can get from their forehead or frontalis muscle. I personally have treated people of East Asian ancestry with Botox to their forehead. And most of the time they're happy with it. And on comparing their before and after photos, their eyes don't appear less open or smaller and they don't feel their eyelids feel heavier. And I'm conservative when treating this area, especially based on someone's eye shape. And I tell my patients, we can always add more, but it's better to add than to do too much and make you feel heavy. But in those who have a very distinct epicanthic fold with no crease and more fat around their eyes, you have to be more careful. And that usually involves giving smaller doses. But for me, it's a case by case basis. I've had one patient that I can remember who was East Asian that did not like Botox to her frontalis. And the good thing about treating this area is the effects where people can feel their eyelids are heavy usually wear off in a few weeks. Now, if you're Southeast Asian, maybe Filipino in general, you're more likely to have an eyelid crease and more open appearing eyes. And if you're Korean, you're less likely to have an eyelid crease. And if you want to get into this ancestries and statistics in more detail, be sure to check this video out after. An interesting thing is although in people of East Asian ancestry, their upper eyelids can have a heavier appearance, their brow position is usually high. And this brings us to the next topic. Another thing you have to take into consideration is eyebrow position. Your eyebrow position can be low, medium, or high. Men usually have a lower brow position, which makes their faces look more dominant and powerful compared to women who usually have a higher brow position. In general, higher brows on females tend to give the eyes a more feminine look as the female hormone estrogen has been linked to giving women higher brows. It's why a lot of female celebrities get surgical brow lifts to enhance their beauty, which Kendall Jenner likely had done, as you can see from the photograph, along with other plastic surgery. This is why so many of my female patients come in saying they want their brows lifted with Botox. But I find it interesting that even on patients that already have a higher brow position, they seem to want their brows to go even higher, which I don't understand how that would enhance your look if your brows are already high. I just don't get it. And I think people don't realize when they already have a high brow position. Over elevation isn't going to do anything to enhance your look if you already have a high brow position. Not in every case, but in general, regarding ancestry and brow position, people of European ancestry tend to have lower brow positions and Africans and East Asians tend to have higher brow positions. Now, what I've personally found is that people of Caucasian ancestry who are North African, Middle Eastern, people from the Mediterranean, like Italians, as well as other European ancestries can have higher brow positions and North African and Middle Eastern people tend to have upper eyelid creases that are very defined. Comment below if you've noticed this. If you're someone who has a lower brow position, you have to be a little careful with how much Botox you put to your forehead because you may not be able to raise your brows as high. But this is the only way we can target your horizontal wrinkles. And if you have more hooding to your lids, you have to be even more careful. A common instance is when a woman with a low brow and more hooded lids says she feels like she has to lift her eyebrows more when she puts on eyeshadow. And again, if this happens, the effects thankfully usually only last a few weeks. And if you have a lower brow position, especially if you have more hooding to your lids, you should consider getting Botox to your glabella. The glabella is an area in between our eyebrows. The corrugator and depressor supercilli, the procerus, and the medial fibers of our orbicularis oculi are the muscles that overlie this area, and they allow us to furrow our brows, and when we do this, our brows move inward and down. So my patients who have a lower brow position usually love treating this area because it prevents them from lowering their brows as much. And when you lower your brows, it makes your eyes look more hooded. The glabella is also a very important bony landmark for sexual dimorphism, which we spoke about in the Botox brow lift video. Sexual dimorphism is what makes a male look like a male and a female look like a female. Men usually have a more prominent brow ridge than women, which are some of the traits that make their faces look more dominant and masculine. The more prominent your brow ridge, the heavier your brow tends to look. Brow ridges also vary by race or ancestry. In general, people of Caucasian ancestry tend to have the most prominent brow ridges, followed by Africans and then East Asians who tend to have the flattest brow ridge. Well, how does this play into getting Botox? I've found that the more prominent your brow ridge, the stronger your muscles overlying the glabella are. 
So if you have a more prominent brow ridge, it usually means you can furrow your brow very well and you're more prone to having deeper 11s. Therefore, you're usually gonna need a good amount of Botox in this area, maybe 20 to 25 units or more, which is why men usually need more Botox units here than women because they have stronger muscles and more prominent brow ridges. I found the flatter your brow ridge, the less likely you are to have strong muscles here. So my female patients of East Asia ancestry or anyone who has a softer, flatter brow bone usually needs the least amount of Botox to their glabella. If you get too much Botox to your glabella, it's just going to be frozen or paralyzed. And there usually isn't an issue with overdoing this muscle as opposed to the frontalis because it's paralyzing the muscle that depresses or lowers your brows. So it's not going to make someone feel heavy, but you could end up paying a lot more than you should because Botox is usually charged by the unit. And I've known some providers who just cookie cut. Let's say they put 20 units in everyone's glabella every single time they come in, even if those muscles don't warrant that high of a dose. And if you've watched my other video on when to start Botox, I spoke about how on some people who are on top of treating this area with Botox regularly, this muscle usually gets less active with time where you don't need as many units to treat it. But some providers will just continue to put the same amount of units as they did the first time they treated you when your muscle was stronger. And if you're you're getting charged by the unit and you don't need as many units, you're going to be paying a higher bill than necessary. So that's why it's always good to have your Botox customized to you and your muscle strength. What do you think your eye shape and brow position is? What type of forehead size do you have? Comment below. Have you noticed these differences? Just start to pay more attention to people's faces when you go out and see if you notice these variations in brow bones, eye shape, and brow positions when it comes to gender and ancestry. Share your thoughts. But don't forget to check these videos out next to learn how you can look more naturally beautiful.